This is Eno Robinson, the voice of Cyborg, and you're listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-01. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D-12. Hello, team. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us for episode 11 of Whelmed Season 3. My name is Rich, and with me is my co-host, Emily. Hey, everybody. In these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, themes, Easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else related to Young Justice. And then we'll use that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we will be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. But you won't need football scouts to get into college if you get your grades up. I got a 4.0 GPA, which maybe you know if I was half as important to you as the dumb machines in this lab. You know my work is important. I know it's important to you. Stop it. There are things happening in this world that are bigger than you and I. And in any case, I will not talk to you while you are behaving in this way. Behave in what way? I'm not some three-year-old trying to get you to taste this mud pie. This is my life you're ignoring. My actual life! Which we can discuss when you've calmed yourself down, boy. Boy? Now you're boying me? At least look me in the eye if you're gonna... You know what? Never mind. Forget it. Victor, wait. Dad? And with that, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The title of this week's episode is Another Freak. The release date was January 25th, 2019. The in-episode date was October 15th. The writer was May Cat. The director was Mel Zwire, and the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. Special guest voice credits this week. We have uh, some new people and a lot of old people playing new parts. Uh, Sarah Fuzzle is uh, coming in as Harper Rowe, having long conversations with herself. Jeff Bennett as Casey Clubba, one of the guards you saw at Star Labs. Beth Payne as both Sarah Charles and the teacher, Lenore Paris. Nolan North as Alan Faden. Jason Spizak as Eddie Corliss. Zeno Robinson as Dale Gunn, and Carrie Payton as Silas Stone, Vic's amazing dad. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode opens with Victor Stone storming into his father's lab in Detroit. The two of them get into a huge argument over how absent Dr. Stone has been from his son's life, an accusation that Dr. Stone dismisses as Victor just being overdramatic. He's not. Victor eventually gives up and storms out of the lab, but as he goes to leave, he accidentally rips a cord out of the Reach anti-meta device we've seen in previous episodes, and that results in a giant explosion. Yeah. All before the credits. Yeah. Dad? After the credits, we cut over to Happy Harbor, where Halo and Forager are getting ready for their first day of school. Artemis presents Forager with a glamour charm from Zatanna so he can blend in as a human teenager, and a very excited Halo, now going by Violet Harper, tells Forager that she picked a new name for him, too. Fred Bug. With two Gs. And everything's fine and dandy. It's gonna be great! It's great. It's great. This is a fun episode. (laughs) And after that momentary bit of lightness, we cut back to Detroit, where Dr. Stone's lab is a disaster, and we see that Vic uh, was caught in the explosion, and crushed by the rubble, causing him some severe injuries. <laughs> Happy fun, Young Justice. We'll call, we'll call it that. Yeah. Yeah. Unwilling to let his son die, Dr. Stone decides to use the father box he was given by the Justice League in a desperate attempt to save his son. And once he places the device on Victor's body, it begins growing weird cybernetic cords, cables, something and eventually encases victor in a strange capsule thing he's in a box he's in a father box evil box an evil evil box 
Meanwhile, over at Happy Harbor High, Violet and Fred Bug are introduced to their classmates. And despite their enthusiasm, their first impression is, uh, no, they were great. It says awkward here, but it wasn't awkward at all. It was just like my first day. <laughs> and while they do make one friend, Harper Rowe, it seems that Halo isn't uh, feeling well. Suddenly, for some strange reason, she is not feeling very good. It's totally normal. Right. And back in Detroit, Vic appears to be dead uh, until the father box fuses with his body, restarts his heart, and grows cybernetic prosthetics to fix the damage Vic sustained from the blast. The anatomically detailed and accurate damage. In Happy Harbor, after Connor leaves for the afternoon, Brion decides to do some snooping, because that's what teenage superheroes do, to see if he can learn anything more about his sister's whereabouts. However, his search is interrupted by the arrival of Nightwing, who informs Brion that his sister Tara was on Santa Prisca, but has since been sent elsewhere, and they're currently trying to track her down. However, Brion isn't too happy about this news, uh, and blames Nightwing for moving too slow to save Tara, and he takes out his frustrations by tackling Nightwing in the driveway. This does not go well does for Brion. No. <laughs> no. So, because after a very short fight <laughs> and a heated argument in the rain, Nightwing uh, realizes that Brion's problems go a lot deeper than Tara and suggests that he do some soul searching about whether he's stuck in the past or looking toward the future. Because Nightwing could punch him into oblivion, but instead decides to give him some <laughs> advice. Right. Back at Happy Harbor High, Violet and Fredbug with two Gs are feeling ostracized from their fellow classmates and confused, uh, but end up having lunch on the bleachers with Harper Rowe, who reassures them that being a freak is a good thing. Back at Star Labs, Victor is released from the mechanical capsule, the evil box. He was trapped in, now with full cybernetic enhancements. However, Vic isn't very happy about what his father did to save him and lashes out, fueled uh, by the father box, uh, intent on killing his father, his anger... Uh, triggering murderous intent. Evil. We then cut back to Happy Harbor High, where Violet still feels sick and ends up glowing indigo as a result. She then opens a boom tube for the first time, which takes her to Star Labs in Detroit. There, Victor attacks her immediately, and she fights back to defend herself. Halo apparently doesn't want to hurt him, and in the middle of this fight, she realizes exactly what she has to do, just kind of on instinct. She starts glowing indigo again uh, and chanting in another language, an act which cleanses Victor of the father box's influence. He asks her to try and heal him fully, but she sadly tells him that's kind of outside of her power set and not something she's able to do, even if she wanted to. Dr. Stone offers to help Victor learn and understand how the father box works, but he refuses, insisting that his father turned him into a freak and he doesn't want anything to do with him anymore. So Victor instead chooses to leave with Halo, and they both return to Happy Harbor High, where McGann is very confused and worried about these kids getting into so much trouble on their first day of school. <laughs> to close out the episode, we cut over to Brian on the beach outside of Mount Justice, or what's left of it, not checking his cell phone for the first time this season. Nightwing arrives to check on him, and Brian admits that while he wasn't okay before, he thinks he will be moving forward. End this episode with a little bit of hope. <laughs> and that's one of Dick Grayson's other powers, in my yes. opinion. Yes. Nice. Let's feel some master. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. This is a fine and happy episode where nothing bad happens and it's great. <laughs> yeah. It's fine. Mm. It's fine. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Go so for that, it. So that what opening fight, that opening fight with Victor and his dad... It's so oh, yeah. good. It's so painful, but it's so good. Yeah, it's very real. Yeah. I think all of us here at Whelmed were like, oh, oh, this this hurts. Especially yeah. Vic's like dad line at the end where he looks back over his shoulder and gets like one second before the explosion happens and we're all just like, I was not prepared on a Friday morning for this kind of pain. <laughs> yeah. When his dad's at his at his side too, and he's laying down there, and and Vic like looks at him with the the one eye he has left, and a tear comes out of it too. It's just like, oh, guys, yeah, yeah, yipers. I will say though about that scene in particular, physically can't 
watch that scene. I, I, the gore is a lot for me. I know it's animated, but it's, it's a lot. Uh, and the acting is incredible in that scene and the gore serves a purpose this time around in a way that we talked about how it didn't really in the previous episode with Halo. But I literally, while taking, I had to, I rewatched this episode twice while taking notes and writing this outline. And both times I literally could not look at that half of the screen while those scenes were happening because it's, it's a lot for me. And I know that's a personal me sensitivity, but still (laughs) I'm throwing it out there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as a nurse, both former veterinary nurse and human nurse, I have seen a lot and uh, that doesn't bother me as much. Like there's like, Oh, I I get this. This is traumatic. And, and again, they didn't necessarily, like if it was the show is still on cartoon network, we could have had the scene without showing quite the detail. Um, And I think that it would have left some to the imagination. And I think that there's definitely, you know, points to do that. I think there's reasons to do that, but this was bad. And, Having his dad be so apparently disconnected from Vic's emotional health and life and having this change for him, basically, like watching like this is this is whatever care and love he has for his son that he thinks he's doing the right thing, like his face is being shoved right in it in that moment. Watching your child uh, in that kind of trauma is it doesn't feel disjointed to have his dad uh, turn on a dime and suddenly care for him when he's, we spent two episodes basically saying, you know, showing him he doesn't really care that much. It makes sense. And the, the extremity of the choice he makes to save his son actually all works for me pretty clearly. What's interesting to me though, too, is that he didn't know how the father box worked, (laughs) right? Because as we, as we see it in, in the beginning of the first episode, it's being used to repair things and to heal people with a, a ray that's very similar to what Halo does to heal herself. He put the he put the thing on him, right? So yeah. like he didn't know how it worked, so he didn't activate the little healing regenerative ray. He was like, I don't know, I'm going to turn it on and sit it on his chest and see what happens. Basically, that's interesting to me, right? So it incorporated itself into him in a way that I just, I mean, I don't. I don't know where this idea where Vic's uh, cybernetics came from a father box or a mother box. Like, I think this has happened in the comics, but I I don't know when this got reintroduced. Maybe it was new 52, but in the original comics, like his dad was, you know, a a cybernetic genius and his son, I think Vic was in a car accident or something that was pretty brutal. And then he, he helped him with that. This makes a lot of sense, particularly for modern storylines. And in Young Justice, making it a father box, which I think is the same thing they did in the Justice League live action as well. And taking this anger, this justifiable anger that we have with Vic and turning it up a notch. You know, I I think you mentioned this a little bit during a Crash in the Mode last episode about how Vic isn't a... He he, He he doesn't doesn't want to be a superhero. Yeah. Yeah. It may have even been the regular episode. He just doesn't want to be a hero. And so... it's not that he doesn't want to be a good person. He's just not interested in being a superhero. He's not fascinated by that world. And so now, I mean, I can't even imagine he'd look at himself and go like, yeah, I'm not Superman or Wonder Woman. I'm this freak, (laughs) right? Yeah. Like, I'm not Green Lantern, right? This isn't a, right? Yeah. So even if he did want to be a hero, he might be like, I don't get this situation. I want to be something else, you know? It kind of now, talking about it, it kind of reminds me of like, the X-Men and Marvel comics of certain characters who are like, I can't turn my power off. I can't just blend. Uh, and the way that changes how you look at having a superpower or look at have, being a superhero. Right. He has that same kind of energy and theme going on, I feel like, right now. Yeah, I agree. And there's a, I don't know, there's a, there is a, I don't know how to put it. Like there's a, it's not subtle. Subtle is not the right <laughs> word. There's something about his cybernetics, though, too. They're not, it's not bulky and huge. Like a lot of the interpretations yeah. of his cybernetics um, in the live action Justice League movie was pretty bulky. On the Doom Patrol live action, I, I, you know, it's tough to do live action and, and have that. So, you <laughs> yeah. know, you got to give him, got to give him a pass for doing the best they can with that. But even in the Teen Titans show, like he was built as a bulky guy in the Teen yeah. Titans animation. And so his cybernetics se- seemed bigger like bulkier and in this one they seem streamlined like he's an athlete you know he's more the i don't know 
not he's not wasn't the quarterback, but like I don't know. There's something he's, about it that I, I look at. He's a teenage it and, athlete. He's not he's not a fully grown man. He's he looks right. like a teenager. And the and I agree with you. Like the the designs for the cybernetics are really cool. Like they mm-hmm. seem to be like the right size. They seem proportionate in a way that you don't see with most of the interpretations of cyborg. Right. And yet his the hand, particularly in that scene where Zeno Zeno, if you guys haven't heard our, our discussion with Zeno Robinson, uh, he was saying he thinks that the line was originally like, you think they can they would let me catch a football with this hand. But instead, he ad libbed it and said, you think they let me catch a football with this thing? And I was like, that's the so psychology good. of Vic right there. But when he does that in that scene and he brings his hand up, it's not human. Right. So it's not just that it's like an armored hand either. So it's not so smooth that it's an armored hand and looks human, but it's not too alien and weird and bulky. I don't know. I just, you know, hats off to Phil Brasso and the design team because I I think this design on him is actually going to be really nice. I completely agree. But to to move away from crying about Vic for forever, uh, I really love the other storyline going on in this episode. I love all of the little setup with Halo being so excited about school and yeah. giving Forager his new human identity uh, and the way Jason Spizak like subtly changes his voice just enough to make it sound more human. Know, right? It's so good. I also love the implication that like every now and then the team just kind of shows up at Zatanna's place like, Hey, we need another glamour charm for a thing. Can you help? She's, <laughs> she's all, I do other things. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's just like, hey, can we have a necklace that makes somebody look different? <laughs> you know I that can't... casserole you make that's really good? Can you make that for the party? <laughs> you know? This is basically what it feels like. She's like, I can literally manipulate the forces of the she's universe, like, <laughs> and you want a costume spell? <laughs> I channeled Isis the one time. <laughs> I love it. I could literally turn him into a human, (laughs) but you just want this. You've never asked. Yeah. Um, But but thematically, I also just really love how the Happy Harbor High plot in this episode mirrors and contrasts McGann and Connor's first day back in Targets in the first episode. In the first season, I mean, and we talked about this a little in Scream Something, but I want to dive into it because I think it's really interesting and thought it was really interesting rewatching this for the millionth time because you've still got like the fish out of water superhero in a normal environment set up that we get in both episodes. But McGann and Connor blend really quickly and it's for a lot of reasons. And I think part of it is that they're attractive suburban white kids. And they're e- they're able mm. to just blend into this environment in a way that like Halo and Fred Bug can't necessarily because wow, of interesting. I th- I think it plays a fact. I think it's there. I think it's subtle. I don't think it's called out as much as no, like, other no. things. But I think it's there. Like seeing them with the rest of their class, you s- you see that difference immediately. Yeah, and like the fact that Halo and Forager are trying so hard to make friends in comparison to like McGann who just kind of walks up and accidentally gets invited to try out for the cheerleading squad and Connor who actively doesn't try at all in season one he literally threatens a student almost gets into a fist fight and damages school property in the first hour that he's there yeah and there's no real ramifications or anybody ostracizing him to the point that Bumblebee even has her line where she's like your boyfriend's weird, but he's hot, so whatever. Yeah, he's he's, he's uh, kind of hot, but he's also kind of a freak. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, Halo and Forager are just trying so hard to be good and to be excited about this and to make friends, and they just can't, except for Harper, <laughs> who is just also another outcast and another weirdo in this school, yeah. to the point that even this time through... I know that she has her line where she says everybody in the cafeteria is just clicky high school cliches. And I'm like, from a certain angle, Connor and McGann probably seemed exactly like that and would have to her if she'd known them back then. I think I've, I think I spent a lot of the first season of our show talking about (laughs) McGann. Did you? Her her clicky, clicky high school cliche. Did I I write a whole thing in response (laughs) to you on Twitter about that before I was on the show? Who can can say? Who who could remember? Yeah, the internet the internet doesn't remember. <laughs> but like from an outside perspective and without knowing everything that we know about them from 
everything else we see of them, they come off as just the perky cheerleader girl and her loner boyfriend. And the fact that this episode kind of acknowledges and responds to all of that in these really subtle ways, like nobody... No, nobody specifically references either of them in the Happy Harbor stuff, except for being like, McGann's the guidance counselor now and we should get her because Halo disappeared. Yeah, It's really interesting that it's there and it's this really cool undercurrent of seeing the way that over the course of three seasons, we're able to see these kind of mirror images of the same setup. Yeah. I really like it. It's really cool. And there's something, there's something too, like there is like the, the naivete that they both have, but there's also this history within the, within the show, right? Yeah. Forager's only experience with humans up to that point has been immediate acceptance. Yeah. Halo's, oh. Halo's, Halo's, oh. yeah, Halo's uh, only reaction, like only thing, the first thing she knows when she wakes up from the situation is Artemis um, supporting her and bringing her into the fold and accepting her, right? And oh, then what hurts. happened, what happened that when, oh, it's, so it's going gonna, gonna to hurt more in a minute because I'm getting somewhere. And so then Forager... What was Forager's first situation when he was stressed and worried about meeting the other team members? What happened? Broke Emily's heart. What, Rich? What happened? <laughs> Tell me. Tell me what thing you're specifically referencing. Halo gave him gave him a big hug and asked him if he'd ever tried apples before, and Brian said, welcome to the team because we're both exiles and I love you. You're an alien. Like, there is nothing else that either one of them has experienced in their life with humans except except acceptance. And oh. allowing them to be in that purity of that excitement of that kind of thing. And, and I think the reason why it jumped out at me is because I have two young kids who are going into, you know, going into school. And so, you know, they're preschool and kindergarten. And um, the preschool, not so much. That was pretty, pretty good and straightforward because the kids are all about the same age. But, you know, they're, when they go into kindergarten, and, or especially in a kindergarten that, that also has like first through eighth grade or whatever, there are all these kids who have already been there for years or have already been established and, you know, that kind of stuff. Even even some of the kindergartners that my kids are around um, have older siblings. And so there's already like this introduction into the community. And, um, you know, my kids are pretty social and outgoing and that kind of thing, but they're not being accepted by every single person, right? They're not like having that happen. And they're having to navigate that, that oddity and that strangeness of like, wait a minute, everything my whole life so far has been, you know, people really wanting me to be in this group and, and, and me having something to give and me wanting them to be there. But it's weird for them to say, hey, I, w- I would love to be around you and, and I would love to spend time with you and have someone be like, I got a thing already going on. Like even not something negative necessarily, just like I already got a, I already got a, have you ever heard of a term called the monkey sphere? No. <laughs> so the monkey sphere is a is a is a sociological concept that explains like uh, this idea of how many people around us we can put full emotional impact into. Like our monkey sphere is it's it's like something like twenty people, right? So we can only like fully emotionally invest ourselves in a certain number of people before we kind of tap out, right? We can't we can be empathic for people in another place that we've never met. Like we can intellectually or emotionally be sad for the things happening for them, but we can't, we can't be in that. Like we can't help everyone all the time at this big level. Right. And so Violet and Fred are coming into a space in which people already have their monkey spheres. And on top of that, I think, I think you make a really interesting point about McGann and Connor, but on top of that, they're socially awkward, right? (laughs) I mean, they're really, really awkward on top of on top of the actual visual situation as well. And it's just it just like breaks my heart seeing this these kind and gentle people. I'm glad they at least have each other. You know what I mean? And I'm glad Harper, who's just like, I am seeing you for you. I'm coming and having a conversation with you. Nobody else came and had a conversation with them. I mean, it was just Sarah having a conversation with herself. But I mean, (laughs) there was still a conversation being had, you know? And ta- and talking about this, I also you pointing out that they've only known acceptance. Uh, yeah. Continuing on with this whole contrast thing, I realized and put together in my head that like McGann and Connor have the exact opposite experience for most of their lives until they get to high school and until they get to like the team because McGann has her whole thing on Mars for yes. most of her life of only knowing what it feels like to be ostracized, and then she gets to Earth and she gets to high school, and it's like, oh, I'm part of a group and I'm part of friendships and having that immediate acceptance is probably so alien for her in comparison and like 
Connor, we see him with the team, he's fine. But like up until joining the team, he was a literal object. And so, you know, that's a whole other thing to unpack. Right. And I think I'm going to talk about this in the um, Canary Debrief about this concept of familiar but different. When you're talking about doing se- not just sequels, but like just um, a- additional episodes or something and having callbacks. I've, I've talked a little bit about that in the past as well, but I think it's really highlighted pretty well in this in this episode. I absolutely agree. But moving on to some of the little details from the Happy Harbor stuff that I love uh, on my 10 million three watch, as we keep finding out, I noticed mm-hmm. that when Harper walks into the class and makes a joke about their teacher, the class laughs. Uh, but you can hear in there, there's the Robin laugh from season one, which is just nice. It's nice to hear. What? <laughs> I didn't catch that. Yeah. If you go back and listen, it's like his, it's his like laugh that plays when he, whenever he does like his ninja thing. I was like, wait a second. Is that Jesse McCartney in there? They just needed laughter. And there's like, what do we have on file? <laughs> Nice little Easter egg. That's funny. And just Harper in general is wonderful. I love her. I want mm-hmm. to see more of Harper Row. I want more of this punk child. I I do too. And I, I don't know that much about her from the comics. So I am curious as to why is she here? And I know she becomes Bluebird. And I know she has some association with the Bat family. But I'm like, I don't know this person, so I don't know why they would pick her. I mean, outside of the, hey, we need, you know, the the law of conservation of DC characters, <laughs> we need someone who, we want someone who's got a name if we have that option to be able to do that. And so they picked Harper, but I can't imagine that that was random, right? Yeah. And so I'm curious as to what they're going to do with uh, with her and, and how maybe her character might change from what there is in the comics. I don't know. I'm curious. We'll see. We'll find out. I also love her just because she accepted... I just love her because I'm like, oh, thank you. Thank you so much yeah. for taking care of our children, right? <laughs> everyone, everyone, everyone loves them. They are precious and naive and they need a punk rock girl with blue hair to show up and just lead them through this chaos of high school. <laughs> to tell them that being different is okay. Yes. All of them, the fans, the fans, two children are being taken care of. <laughs> I also want to throw out, I don't think I wrote this down in my notes because it's been a chaotic week, but. When we first watched these episodes and we talked about it and screamed something a little bit, I immediately was like, wait, why are they going to Happy Harbor High? Like, Halo doesn't live here. Why are we sending her here? And I realized that it's almost definitely because it's like, McGann will be there to keep an eye on these children and make sure that nothing bad happens. Yes. And I like that. And I like that, like, Forager knows immediately of like, so Halo's powers acted up and she teleported to I don't know where. And you're the guidance counselor. Guide us. Please. Right. That's funny. I just imagine him bursting into an into her office, though, while she's having another meeting. <laughs> there is a problem. Right. Assist. But there is so much happening in this episode. Like... The whole Nightwing and Brion thing in the rain. <laughs> yeah. I was like, Brion, what? And I love how Dick just like, because up to now, Dick hasn't been fighting anybody. He's basically been, they've been playing tag and like, yep. you know, dodging or whatever. And he's just like palm strikes him in the chest. And I'm just like, oh, ouch. Like, please don't. Just he's don't. Like, You're going to go there? Fine. If we're going to go there. We're going to go there. <laughs> yeah. I do. I am not going to be burned from head to toe either. So let me just have you make it clear what's happening here. And the fact that like, he doesn't prolong it. We don't get a giant action sequence in the rain between these two characters as cool as that would be because Nightwing just takes him down, calls him out knowing exactly what's wrong because he's kind of been there. And I love that it's not called out explicitly. It's just this subtle thing of like, Oh, Oh, that's what's wrong with you. And that's, that's the thing that was amazing to me. Like when I saw it and you hear, you hear that, Tone and Dick, it's not just that he knows people, it's that he knows that feeling himself. Like, are you going to live in the past? I mean, the whole point of him becoming Robin with Batman was so that Bruce could help him let go of the past to be in the, like, you you know he's he's parroting some, you know, paraphrasing some version of Bruce's speech to him at some point, right? Like, what are you going to do, right? Yes, we're going to, we're going to find Zuko, we're going (laughs) to, we're going to put him in jail, right? We're going to do this, and then, and then what do you do? (laughs) I forgot that that gangster's name is Zuko. I was very confused for a second. I was like, why are we oh, finding right. the Fire Nation prince? <laughs> why are we bringing him here? Tony uh, Zuko. Different okay. character. Right. Also I don't think Zuko's... I don't, Zuko I don't, I don't, from Greece. <laughs> right. 
I don't think Z- I don't think Zuko's things. first name was Danny in uh, Avatar. No, his first Maybe. name was Zuko. <laughs> right. What was his last name? Zuko. There are no last names in the Avatar. Apparently, universe, except Toph. <laughs> Toph gets a last name. Oh yeah, that's right. Only one. Fun facts about Avatar. Oh, that's right. And what was but, her grand? What was her granddaughter's name? Beifong, Lin, and the other one. <laughs> Oh yeah, there was another. There was a sister, Lynn Bayphone, the the Batman of <laughs> Batman and the Spider Man of the, ba- the Spider Bat of of Avatar. She's my favorite character. I love her so much. But after this t- this tangent, a random fun fact about this scene actually that I found on Twitter and have held on to for this moment uh, is the fact that apparently Brion's patience line that he like screams at Nightwing in the rain uh, apparently became basically a meme among the crew uh, (laughs) and the storyboard artists Uh, Christina Soda who is one of I believe the storyboard artists if I'm remembering correctly that is her job uh, posted about it on Twitter after the episode came out and according to her quote uh, every time we hit a difficult section that we'd rage about we asked is this your patience moment and would send each other uh, the screenshot of Brion just screaming in the rain with like block quote at the bottom that just says patience with like 12 question marks she posted a bunch of photos of what they would send to each other check it out it gave me a very big laugh oh yeah one of them says one of them says triggered there's like a whole bunch of them that's so funny (laughs) he just does not like being told to have patience it's kind of a theme but (laughs) I loved that Right before that scene, I will throw out, because it was on my mind watching this, uh, we have, Connor gets one line in this episode, and it's just jumping on his bike and leaving for a bit so that Brion can be alone for a while. But I thought it was so weird at first second where I was like, Connor puts on a helmet, but not any other form of protection. And I was like, what is, why? And I like started overthinking it way too long where I was like, does this, like he can't get like cut, like he can't get road rash, but maybe he can get a concussion, but that doesn't make any sense because like we've seen him get thrown into walls and had nothing bad happen. And I like thought about this way too long and then my brain supplied the answer of no, but if he's not wearing a helmet, he's going to get pulled over for yes, not wearing a helmet. Illegal, right? So exactly. it's just a blending in thing. <laughs> it's really not that complicated. Right. <laughs> And I just needed to share that it's sometimes the answer is so much simpler than overthinking superpowers. <laughs> but speaking of powers, I do love, I really like in this episode how we see that Halo's powers run on instinct more than anything else. And mm-hmm. we can talk about that more possibly in Crashing the Mode. But like she has the moment where she's like, it's so strange, but I think I know what I'm supposed to do. And she just goes and cleanses Vic, like she's like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I think this is right. Uh, And I just think that's really cool, especially because we see her in battle just kind of like instinctually switch between her different auras and be like shield, blast, flying back and forth. And it's not because she's like skilled at it. It's just like an automatic switch. And that's really interesting seeing how they incorporate that into her fight scenes. Right. Even the first time she uses it is that red protective force field. Yeah, I was like, yeah. I panicked. Yeah, right. But also, I think all, you, me, and Neil, I think all had this question, and none of us have an answer, but what the heck does she chant? I don't know. That goes into left field for me. Like, I'm, all the rest of her powers obviously are working just on whatever this intuitive thing is, but I'm like, is the, I don't know. Because I'm like, those are definitely words, and they definitely mean something. Yeah, but... and I keep trying to hear it, but there's so much echo going on, too. It's hard to tell the language of what's going on, if it's something that's already been established or whatnot. And I, I have I have some one thing I can talk about, maybe, but it, it's going to have to be in Crashing the Mode. So, yeah, I don't know. But that's weird <laughs> to me. Weird. Yeah. Not, not in a bad way. Just, whoa, what? Like, why? Why? I, yeah. I feel the exact same way. I'm just like, this feels right, but also, what's yeah. happening? <laughs> yeah. Also, with that same scene, Vic's final outburst at his dad is just so good. Uh, and we talked about like the ad lib from Zeno about calling the hand a thing instead of a hand, which is also incredible. And yeah. I also just really like the idea that like the father box just amplifies and distorts 
someone's existing issues because it's not he wasn't being mind controlled he was just being pushed over the edge yeah. and seeing that distinction and how that blurs the line of like everything with victor and anyone who yeah. would come in contact with this thing is so cool and so interesting <laughs> A father box solution to that level of of anger and life disruption is murder the problem, <laughs> is murder the source, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, as opposed to maybe a mother box's response might be very different, right? De- more de escalation thing, and <laughs> not so much with the father box. And I love how he points that out too. It's like, no, let's be real clear about what's what. Yeah. Right. Let's be real clear. The murder, murdering people, that was the father box. Do not think that I am not primally angry at you yeah <laughs> for very good reasons you can you will not be able to blow that off and blame it on a father box you you are go are, are a part of this right oh so good and the interest and the super interesting way that he lays it out where his dad is like you'd be safer here and he says yeah but you wouldn't be yeah exactly and like that that self-awareness is super interesting as a character yeah. trait but also the fact that he just says it flat out he's like if I stay here, there is a chance I will try to kill my dad again. Yeah. I'm going to leave. I don't want to kill my dad, so I'm just going to leave. Just that just that line in and of itself has so many layers, right? Yes. So <laughs> one, I don't want to kill you. Two, I am still angry at you and that is not going away. Three, because I am still angry at you and that is not going away anytime soon, I might get triggered to actually murder you, which would cause me pain and hurt and heartbreak because I love you so much. And also, I hate you right now. Like, everything is all wrapped up in the one line of like, that's it. But you won't be safe. And it's not like, but I want to save you. No, it's like there is so much psychological baggage in that just that one line. Uh, incredible. It's so good. Yeah. The dynamics this- between parents and children are not usually written this well, right? I, I, in my opinion. I think I had some grasp of it before I became a parent, but now that I've been a parent, then a lot of these things jump out at me, maybe maybe more. But, like, they can be so cliche for some reason. And none of these dy- – and there's so many kids with so many parental figures in this show, and every one of them feels like, oh, you know? Feels real and different and wonderful. And, and different. That's the thing. They're not all the same, right? They're not all stereotypes. Like even his dad, like I have these things. I have this, I don't know if, I, if it was how it was written, how it's presented, or maybe it's just my head canon. I don't know. But I feel comfortable looking at even Silas and saying like, where's your wife? Your wife kept you in check, right? Or I don't even know. I mean, I think from the comic, no, he, yes, he, he had he had a wife. So he, so you were this person that your wife fell in love with, right? Something happened to to Vic's mom, and I don't remember what it was, but she passed away. And Vic is clearly a caring, loving person, right? He tried. We get to see that side of him, right? But this dynamic with his dad clearly kind of came into effect. I don't know. To me, it's pretty obvious it came into effect later in their relationship, when, like after his mom died, Right. Otherwise, he wouldn't even be bothering at this point, right? Why would he bother to, like, have a joke with his dad on the phone in the previous episode if for 17 years his father has been that non-present? It just, you just wouldn't bother. You'd be burned out by that point, right? So I guess there's all this, like, subtlety woven into the situation. <sighs> it's, it's crazy that none of that is stated in this episode. Nope. But I had the exact same feeling about this character and how it works and is, is this is this may cat's first episode of young justice yes if i remember correctly that is correct w- which is incredible all on its own yep uh shout out to may cat for mm-hmm. writing a fantastic episode uh just that's just that's yeah stuff I, like i have stuff, nothing to add i'm just stuff amazed. like the the mud pie line right i i paused after that line it seems like a silly it seems like it could have been a silly line it, it, it see it could have even felt out of place, but it totally doesn't. And the way that the, between the writing of it, the placement within the argument, how it got placed, Zeno's interpretation of that line, and how it was presented, Jamie Thomason's direction of Zeno, like everything came into this place where I just got punched in the face. And again, maybe because I have younger kids, where it's like I understand how every single thing feels like life shatteringly important, 
you know, like, Papa, come see this thing. And you come in and like, it's a fly, you know? And it's just like, okay, all right. But that's kind of what he's saying, right? It's like, you were blowing me off as if what I'm talking about is in, is irrelevant to actual life. I am not a child trying to get you to eat my mud pie. This is my life. I was just like, what? That line is gold. Absolute pure gold. Amazing. Hats off to May Cat with two T's. <laughs> Which is funny because she actually posted something about that. She's like, May Cat with two T's got to write Fred Bug with two G's and I've never felt more seen. <laughs> <laughs> she put that in a tweet. I'll try and find it. Put it in the show notes. It's, it was so funny. It was it was great. I remember seeing that when the episode first came out. I was like, oh, that makes me happy. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> oh, uh, my God. The other thing that's crazy about this episode to me, the other thing that's that I that I love so much, I should say, there are so many supporting cast characters. Like I nodded to a bunch of them at the beginning, but like, and we talked a little bit about some of these in in uh, Scream Something. But Casey Kleba is the security guard at Star Labs. I have a link. I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, Dale Gunn, who's the other guard that's with him there, is actually his husband. In the comics, they're married. I don't know if that's a situation in this particular case, right? Eddie Corliss, who Jason Spizak does a quick line of. He's the one who just says freaks. He's the kid in the front row that just says freaks when they walk off. Eddie Corliss was in the original team. He was responsible for the original Teen Titans for getting together because he had been a police officer in some small town and had asked, I think it was Speedy, Kid Flash, and Robin to come to the town for some kind of political thing in the 60s when the comic was written and then Mr. Twister attacked, which is where the team got together. Um, Lenore Paris, <laughs> probably, probably heard me in multiple places talking about Lenore Paris. Miss Paris is the teacher at Happy Harbor High and was a teacher not in the Super Friends cartoon from the 1970s, but in the <laughs> Super Friends cartoon tie-in comics from the 70s. She was the teacher for Zan, uh, Jan and Zena and... Who Marvin and Wendy and just deep cuts, deep cuts. Alan deep Faden, cuts. who's one of the star scientists, um, is a Firestorm supporting character. So I'm like, are we going to get Firestorm at some point? Or like, I, you know, every time they bring somebody in, I'm just like, it just never ends. Sarah Charles, star scientist, the other star scientist that was in the room. Uh, she's the mother of a, of a woman named Latanya Charles, who eventually becomes Cyborg Girl. <laughs> Cyber girl. I'm sorry. Hearing it out loud made it more of a ridiculous name. Yeah. Like I read it and was like, okay. And then having you hearing you pronounce Cyborg the way those girl. two words are mashed together. Yeah, the, it's an sure it's a mouthful. A fun experience. It's one of those things like like the the the, the, the tornado twins being named Don and Don. You don't think about it when you're reading it because it's D O N and D A W N. So you're like reading it and you're like, oh yeah, that's cute. Until you are a parent. And then you're like, why would you do that to yourself? Which is why Young Justice changed it to Donnie. Donnie. Don. Started calling him Donnie. Yeah, and exactly. Like, oh, thank you. <laughs> Seriously. Anyway, that woman too, Sarah Charles, that star scientist, at least in the comics, obviously there's an age difference now, but it had an on-again, off-again relationship with Vic as well in the comics. But Vic was obviously older at that point. In the same vein of like all of these background characters, I realized on like rewatching this episode, that shot of the classroom where they kind of just show you all of the different students reacting to Halo and Forager. I love that everyone looks like they could be a main character in something else. Right. I love that all of the students like have a designs. personality and have like a look to them because yeah. I think that just speaks to like the care and attention to detail that this art team puts into stuff because you could easily just be like, just put everybody in a t-shirt and have three interchangeable hairstyles, but they're like, no, everyone gets a design. <laughs> and I love it. I love it. Nice. I'm trying to see what other notes I had. Yeah, I think that, I think we'll go ahead and wrap all that up. Let's see what, what Neil's got. First time stamp is uh seven sixteen. So there's our, there's at least one sixteen for our episode. Uh, Neil put a note in here, which I think is really kind of cool. It, it's a science trope, but one I love if done well, no one argued about whether or not the father box could actually heal Vic, but they had it. They did have a discussion as to whether or not it should be used, and it's it's oftentimes the flip, right? It's like I don't know. Is this going to work? Would this be a thing? Maybe we could. You know, I don't know. How check your check your numbers or whatever, right? Instead, yeah. they're just like, 
oh no, this was a thing from an alien world. And what? Like, I don't think this is a good idea. Like, and having a moral conversation, which is something that maybe we should have more often, I'm thinking. Because, like, they know it's a weird alien thing and they're a weird world full of superheroes and they've been told this heals things. And they're like, okay, these are two facts we know. Right. It'll probably work. Right. But we've all, the other fact we know about this is that it's evil. And if you are calling a piece of technology evil, right, then you've got to have some strong evidence. Nice. Um, one thing comment that Neil makes here too, which is fantastic, is with a little practice, Halo can make the G designation obsolete. They have their own teleporter now. Which true? I also, especially because of how we saw it work in this episode, ah. I don't think it's one of the powers she can control necessarily. Yeah. Like, I think it's one of those things that just, like, it happens sometimes, and you go with it. I think that way, like I was saying, with a little practice. I think that, I think, well, I don't know. We don't know what, we don't know what she can do. We'll have She's to crash, we'll crash the on mode the on some of that. magic chart. <laughs> Thank you for that 5th edition D&D re- reference. <laughs> I appreciate that. You're welcome. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, of course, uh, <laughs> we're going to put some of this, and some more things in Crash in the Mode, but... Yeah, Lobo's Lobo's pinky fingers regenerating at the end of this episode. I think it's so interesting that both you and Neil jumped to that conclusion immediately because <laughs> I did not think that at all until either of you put it out there. Because uh-huh. my first thought was, ah, that's just a decomposing finger. <laughs> no. That's just a weird decomposing alien finger. It's because I, I read a whole arc back in the oh, 80s where Lobo bleeds out, he gets actually hurt by someone and bleeds out, and every every single red, every single cell in his blood turns into one of him. So, like this is a this is a trope for Lobo. So this is definitely Why definitely are a comics thing. like this. <laughs> he murdered his whole planet as well. Like there's a whole planet full of these people that could do this, and he he was in jail at some point. Like he was put in jail because he genocided his own people or something. It's really weird, and also hung out with space dolphins. It was very strange. It was very I, strange. I repeat, why are comics <laughs> like this? Because they have to find storylines. You got to find storylines. 80 plus years of this stuff, right? With thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of characters putting out monthly stories. Not all of them are going to be gold. They're just not all going to be gold. It's going to be this. It's fine. Also, I think they were mocking. I think they were mocking. I mean, Lobo is clearly a mocking of Wolverine because he kind of came into existence during peak Wolverine uh, coming into the public consciousness as well. So, all right, well, let's cut off. We'll we'll take a quick break with the mid-roll and our Canary debrief, get some fan service, and then crash this mode. Ah, yeah. Uh, Welcome to the Fake Your Own Death Club. Its membership is very exclusive, and I'm the president. Hello, team, and welcome to the mid-roll. We have a new five-star review this week by Pete the Master. Great post-binging. This is a radical podcast for anyone who's seen the show or plans to watch with. The in-depth discussions about the storytelling of each episode are really cool to hear, even as someone who doesn't do much storytelling themselves. As a dice RPG player especially, it's fun to hear what a game master could do. They also point out the groundwork that the creators of the show laid all throughout the show and gives me a new appreciation for a show that I already loved. Rich, Emily, Caleb, and their various guests are a great way to stave off those post-binge feels until the rest of Outsiders drops. Great job on the actual play, and keep it up. Thanks so much for a choice podcast. (laughs) Thank you so much, Pete the Master. We appreciate it. We still don't have any solid announcements on Young Justice or DC Universe panels at San Diego Comic-Con. Luckily, my own work schedule this year will allow me to attend more than one day. So if there is a panel or any information, one or more of the Whelm team will definitely be there. As usual, I'll live tweet the panels as time and circumstances allow, so keep an eye on our Twitter feed, at the YJ Files. Even if you aren't signed up for Twitter, all those posts are public, so feel free to follow along. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the show. Stick around. Class is in session. In our Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process from the episodes that we review. This week, I wanted to talk about sequels. In many cases, when a show has a great first season or a movie is a breakout hit and a sequel is coming, producers and creators do one of three basic things. They make something entirely different 
in feel and tone. They wander around not sure what to do (laughs) because they really love that first movie but aren't sure what to do next. Or they cleave too closely to the original for the sequel to feel fresh and new or giving us anything uh, unusual or unique for their next story. In some cases, creators are too close to the works to understand what it was that made it popular in the first place. And this calls back to episode seven's debrief, where I talked about collaboration. There's a reason there's a writer's room for a TV series or editors for a movie or novel. You need to have perspective from others about what works and what doesn't work and why. And this season has a number of callbacks to the first and second seasons. Uh, and some characters like Brian, as we've mentioned over and over again, echo characteristics that made us love characters like Connor. But an important aspect to consider in making a sequel is the idea of familiar but different. Brian isn't Connor. He has Connor's temper and his early immaturity on many levels, but Brian is also far more expressive. Where Connor was just angry, Brian is passionate. His passion through most of this season has been powered by an understandable grief and loss, but you can see him express himself freely with both Halo and Forager in a way that Connor was never able to. Familiar, but different. Another good example is back from Rescue Op. The new team, just calling the outsiders (laughs) to make it easy, takes off against orders to do what they think is right their first actual mission together. The show calls it out as well when Connor says, does Cadmus ring any bells? And Dick responds with, I hate being the grown-up. This callback highlights many important things for us, the watchers. It shows the growth of the season one team and how their lives are so different now. And it also grounds us in how similar, but also how different this new team is. The season one team can use what they learned eight years before to guide these new younger characters But it's so much different from their own personal experiences that we as watchers and they as characters involved in the story don't know for sure what will happen next. There are several good ways to do a sequel, and not all of them invoke the familiar but different format. But understanding this idea, the idea of familiar but different, and why it works will give you a clear concept of what you want to do with your own work. All right, let's get on some fan service. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. In fan service, we're taking some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creations celebrating DC, Young Justice, and other creative works that we think Young Justice fans will love. This week, we are hyping Protean City Comics. Protean City Comics. <laughs> Protean City Comics. I love them. <laughs> is not an actual comic imprint yet, but we're hoping. Anyway, we've had a string of emails and reviews mentioning uh, our own actual play podcast of Masks, A New Generation. So it seemed appropriate to share one of our favorite actual plays with you guys, Protean City Comics. Protean City is the brainchild of Brandon Leon Gambetta and James Malloy from the Stop, Hack, and Roll podcast network and stars Jess Benini as Arcana, Rob Harvey as Frequency, James Malloy as Puck, Elspeth Denman as Penance, Mark Zurich as Sokotoa, Brandon Leon Gambetta as Winshear and includes a wide range of special guests, including our own Emily Booza, who's special guested as now fan favorite Celeste Thompson, a.k.a. Highwire. Uh, Protean- they, let, they let me play a circus themed hero with a built in <laughs> love life as part of her backstory. Protean City Comics lets you maximize your nonsense. Nonsense. And yeah. I love it. Also food allergies. <laughs> yes. Which came up in play. Yeah. Which is the best. <laughs> Guys, I really love Protean City Comics, and it's not just because they let me play like a ton of tropes I love. <laughs> it's not just because of that. No, we've been big fans since it first started. Um, Protean City, it's easy to binge, and each each story arc is broken into chapters, basically like a mini series uh, that you find in comics. So like two, three, four, five part series. Every episode opens with the description of the cover of the episode too, which is really cool, um, which gives you this great feeling of foreshadowing when you're looking at things. And they create those covers after obviously they've recorded the episode and done all the improv. And then you, when they sh- talk about the covers, you're like, how did they get there? How did they get to this space in the improv? Um, and so part of it's really understanding, like like wanting to see how they get to that point. It, it's beautiful. And then even the scenes within the comics, uh, Brandon and James really focus on what, what does this visually look like in a comic? So it's almost like you're, 
you're hearing like an audio comic. It's amazing. Um, we love, absolutely love Protean City here in the Watchtower, and we can't recommend this amazing actual play enough. And we'll have a link uh, down in the show notes. And the most recent arc, I don't even know what to say. I, I, it's yeah, it was. Lot. But I also, one of the things I personally love about Protean City comics that I will throw out there that I think a lot of people who love Young Justice for the fact that it feels like a living DC universe will really love Protean City comics because they have created this world of a fictional comic book imprint of yep. a fictional comic book publisher with a fictionalized comic book publishing history mm-hmm. and will reference things as if they are just stuff that has happened in this universe yep. that just completely inform the world building in such fantastic ways. Like they will just casually be like, oh, right, that hero got killed off in like the infinite crisis equivalent that they'll have a name <laughs> right. for and they'll just throw this out as if it exists in this world. And I'm just like, wait a second. Yep. What? I love it. I love how they do world building. Uh-huh. I love how they do everything, but I'm throwing that out as a special thing about Protean City Comics. Yep. We could talk about Protean City forever. I it was like, there's there's six things I want to say, but we're going to leave it at that. You can go experience Protean City yourself at the links and check them out. We think that you'll really enjoy them. All right, let's crash the mode. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in Season 3. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on Wild Flights of Fancy. These spoilers will be based only on the first 13 episodes, as that's all we've seen at this time. So if you're spoiler wary, this is your warning. So Halo is a mother box. Halo is a mother box. And this language thing, like this time I was listening and I was like, is this, have they done a new gods or apocalypse style language with subtitles? I just couldn't remember. And I was listening and I was like, I can't make out anything that she's saying at all. Like I can't even make out a made up language because of the, the effects that were laid on top of it. So I'm having a hard time under knowing if this is something that's already been established, but we know clearly they don't put random languages <laughs> In Young Justice, right? They at least now put effort in, you know? Now that you've said it, I think that I think that the new gods have had a language. They definitely have, because we saw, like, Macomb used it at one point. The, the new gods that we've seen have used it. I think in season two, right? When they show up, when they... Season sh- one. Was it season... The new oh, gods it was season, season one. one. Yeah, yeah, you're right. They don't show up in season two at all. <laughs> no, you're right. It was season one. Sorry. Well, oh, yeah, no. I'm getting... For some reason, I'm getting... I was getting confused with some other things anyway when (laughs) bear first shows up he's using a bunch of that language Ah, so maybe might be i'd have to really take a good listen to it and find out so yeah and in the first episode with forager uh when they have the scene at the intro scene at the beginning that's the bugs talking to macomb as orion they're all speaking like a new genesis language with subtitles for that whole thing if i'm pretty sure if i'm remembering correctly so then I'm, I'm still wondering like, okay, so it is, a, so if it is, if it is this new Genoese language, right? <laughs> I'm not sure what to say about that uh, or how to pronounce that. So I, if it, Genosian, new Genosian, I don't know. No, because Genosha like, is a thing from Marvel comics. Oh yeah. But isn't it like a, I thought there was a thing from Star Wars too. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> so why does she this need is, to use the this language? Is the episode of the references. I know, right? <laughs> it's like everything but Young Justice. So why would she need to do that? Was she verbally reprogramming it or like giving it an order in order to reprogram it? And if she can, if, if she is a mother box can reprogram a father box, why in the world can't the father box reprogram that? Also Vic saying like, what kind of abomination are you is super fascinating to me. Like the father box immediately recognized what was happening. <laughs> It was like, wait a minute, like you're a human body with all kinds of energetic wavelengths of a mother box coming off of you. You're not okay. I'm okay because I'm (laughs) still a father box in a metal casing. Like I still have a physical form. Like you're just, I don't know what you are. And I'm like, what is this very finger pointing here? Kettle black thing. Yeah. It's fascinating. Absolutely. I am. I have ruined this child's life and mutilated their human form. Yeah. But you're the weird one. Yes, exactly. It sounds like a father box. Yeah, it right. does. Yeah. And on on some level, 
honestly, I could chalk up the Halo chanting in whatever language it is to like rule of cool. It looks cool to give her something weird to say. Yeah. But it's young justice. It's young justice. They don't do it like that, right? (laughs) They don't do that. I mean, they at least took the time to to try and get someone who spoke Greek to like translate some version of Atlantean based on ancient (laughs) Greek. Like, come on. You know? They made up a Croatan language. Like they did something. Like they they did stuff. I feel like I feel like it might be too powerful, to, though, just to say she can just verbally reprogram a father box. I feel like it's got to no, be. No, not verbally. I mean, she clearly, like, she project. Oh, here's the other. Here's another thing. This, it's all strange. But <laughs> the other thing is, okay. <laughs> Sorry. This seems so silly. So I grew up with learning the rainbow colors with the yeah. phrase Roy G. Biv, right? As. As we all did. Well, but wait. So red, orange, yellow, green, uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, right? And that's what it looks like they might be using here. But my kids aren't learning that. My kids are learning a song that's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, and they just have purple. They don't have indigo and violet. And First so they took Pluto. Now they're taking indigo. <laughs> you know, what is and happening? And violet. I know, right? So I'm watching this and I'm like going... Is that indigo? Did she have a new color for the boom? A new color for the boom tube? And then is the healing reprogramming thing? She did the violet color on him. And if she did it, because she says my violet aura doesn't work that way. If it could have healed you, it would have. And I'm like, okay, so it was a healing aura, but then she used the words with it. And she's never healed somebody else. She's only healed herself, right? She tried to heal Plasmus, but he was already dead. And she said there's no life in him. But she hasn't had to heal anyone else. So I'm just, I don't know. I was like, is the, is the, in, is the color of the boom tube the same color she used to reprogram? Or is it the violet? I think it was the violet. I th- I thought it was indigo until right now. I think you're I think you're right though. I think the boom tube is indigo, which is a new color, and the violet color was the healing color because of the fact he says, "Can you you can heal me? I felt you heal me." And she said, "If I, if it could heal you, my violet my violet aura doesn't work that way. If it could heal you, it would have." So I think you're right. I think that there is a distinction between indigo, which I think is the boom tubes and and uh, Violet, which I think is the healing part. No, I mean, I thought that she used Indigo to both cleanse him and do the boom tube thing. I thought both of those oh, were the see, same color. I, see, I was confused by that too, and I was thinking maybe that was the case originally. So, But I'm not visually... I mean, already Indigo and Violet are tough for me to tell anyway, but I'm also not, a vis- not, not that kind of visually... They're really close. That's why they changed the song. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> to Purple. So if, well, if, but if the more like, I don't want to say powerful, but like, I mean, opening up a boom tomb is super mother boxy, I guess. Like that's a real specific new Genesis level of major technology, you know, flying in force fields or whatever. Right. But a boom tube, boom tubes go, go across the freaking galaxy. That's a powerful ability. So I guess tapping into that part in reprogramming the father box is a thing. Like, I don't know. I'm not sure. We'll see. I I was, for whatever reason, my brain was just like interpreting Indigo as like the catch-all for like the weird, too powerful stuff. <laughs> right. Exactly. So I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, well, we'll, we'll have to see if Gregor Brandon addressed that at some point. Um, but let's talk about this finger. <laughs> Um, Neil put in some stuff here. He's a big Lobo fan. So he says there, there've been two really notable young Lobos. Uh, one is Slobo who was a surviving clone of Lobo after he split into an army of little Lobos, uh, the strongest surviving to become the adult Lobo again. Uh, he was named by secret, which is interesting. Uh, as Slobo, for some reason. He eventually degraded physically and sacrificed himself to save Secret from Darkseid's Omega Beams because he knew he would die soon anyway. So that's rough. That's that's a lot. That's a lot. And then uh, the other lot. one uh, is apparently, which I never knew. I knew about Slobo, but I didn't know about this one. Crush is the daughter of Lobo in the latest Teen Titans run. She crash-landed as a baby in the middle of... <laughs> Oh, no. What, Rich? 
Uh, she crash landed as a baby in the middle of Burning Man. <laughs> so would not have been seen as strange at all. And I, 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 I speak from experience. For those That's of you who don't so know, I was, I was a, ra- I was, I was a, I was a ranger at the burn for doing local events for a long time. So yes, this sounds, this makes perfect sense. Uh, and then she was surrounded by a sen- sentient chain named Obelis and was raised by two humans who found her and took her in as their own. Her mother or complete origin is still unknown. I don't know. I'm looking said, at all that said, given of the- her right now and she looks real cool. Nice. Well, she grew up at the burn, so, you know. She looks super punk rock. Nice. All that said, given the frequency that the team goes to the quarry, my theory is that they will find a baby Lobo that needs to be taken care of, and there is no super couple I could think of to better take them in than Emily's favorite couple. <laughs> wow. I before we started recording, Neil messaged us and wanted to hear hear my response <laughs> so my response is I'm i honestly i honestly really don't want that <laughs> <I've>, <laughs> <laughs> and it's and it's just because i'm shocked i tells you <laughs> it's literally just because connor and mcgann have been through a lot they're currently taking care of like two teenagers Give them a break for like a couple of years before you throw an adopted alien kid at them. Like, I firmly believe in a couple of years, Connor and McGann would definitely take in like adopted alien child yeah. that they would raise as their own. Firmly believe that. Their propensity for taking in strays is well known. Uh huh. But in a few years. <laughs> They're but like, there's a difference there's a difference between guiding teenagers and raising a child and I think it's yes. very important for them to be able to uh flex those muscles and I think they would be great because I mean I don't <laughs> think they can have one themselves I don't know how any of that would work Well actually I don't even know because McGann's shape changing happens on a genetic level so oh you're nodding <laughs> the whole time <laughs> like the Rich, as someone who has been in the Super Martian fandom since I was thirteen, this <laughs> you've read about one hundred and thirty-seven children. <laughs> someone made a PowerPoint one time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fandom! I love I you. I distinctly remember the Tumblr PowerPoint that just began with a title screen that just said. Can McGann and Connor have kids? And I was like, please present your evidence. Now I'm please, curious. Please. You may continue. You have our attention. Yes. Wow. So like, I don't know. Wow. My, <laughs> my, my, my general thought process is they are, they're like, what? I'm, I'm blanking on the math now, but they're what? Like tw- 24, 23 around there? Well, wait. McGann is okay, much older. But I mean I'm oh. ignoring the fact that Connor is okay. 6 and McGann is like 50. Because- okay, so assuming they were 16 <laughs> in season 1. Math says they were they're now 24. 24? I'm just trying to remember. 7 how many years 7 past. years worth of time jumps plus a half a season or a half a year in season 1, a half a year in season 2 is 8 years. Yeah. And I'm like that's especially because of everything they've been through over the course of these three seasons. They only just got engaged. Give them a little time to settle down and I don't have a pr- I don't have a problem with that. But I don't before disagree. Before we hand them a baby. But I don't disagree with Neil's statement. And Neil's statement is I can't think of a better couple, a better superhuman couple than them to raise this child. And I agree. Superboy's got the he's got the physical strength and the speed and uh, to be able to keep up with it. McGann's got the compassion, the, tele- the the telepathy, the ability to track the child when it runs off into the woods and starts destroying. I don't even know what with its sentient chain. Yeah, I don't know if the oh. chain's going to be there, but <laughs> I don't know. Because now I'm just imagining. Because because Neil has put this out to the world, and I was looking at all of the art for the for both of these Lobo children. I'm just like you give you give the former teenager and just the local mechanic the most punk goth kid. 
I love it. <laughs> Dear God. I'm looking. I gotta look at these images now myself. Hold on. Please do. Please. Oh look yeah. At how extra these children are. She's like. Uh, she's also. She's like. Looks like death is like her mom. Like from the. From, from Sandman. From Sandman. Yeah. Totally. She, does. she totally does though, right? That but opening. But she's so much angrier than death, which sure right. is a statement to make. But it's well, true. If Lobo's her dad. Oh gosh! You know what? I would love to see this character. I'm I'm not the biggest Lobo fan. Uh, I I like him when he's he's used as kind of almost like comedy relief, kind of mm, that kind of thing. But like, th- she's rad. We should. I want to see her. She's rad. Teach her some compassion. <laughs> in a in a in a few years. <laughs> Okay. I'm like, because my brain is just like in my mind. I'm like, Connor and McGann are are still no, children. I get it. I get it. But they're Give they're not though. Break. But maybe, yeah. I know they're not. <laughs> but I'm like, we're as I got gotcha. you as someone gotcha. close to their age. I am like, no, no, <laughs> do not just hand a baby to someone no. this age, an alien baby that they were not prepared for. I was in my 40s when I had children. I agree with you 100. <sighs> percent <laughs> And with that complete absurdity, thank you, Producer Neil, <laughs> for the end of this episode. Let's wrap this up uh, in Zeta Out of the Watchtower. Thank you all for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at theyjfiles.tumblr.com, on our website, crashingthemode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email us directly at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help other people find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S., because we have to look a little harder to find all of those ones. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.